tea and notebook Tuesday. Do, 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 do. Hello, and welcome to Tea and New Book Tuesday. I'm Lisa. I'll be your librarian today. So, yeah, I'm sleepy enough to be weird today. So, you know, feel about that however you're going to feel about it. And yes, thank you, Jennifer. I've got this uh, set up now so I can see the chat for the first time ever. So I can actually respond when you guys say something, which will be very nice. All right. So, let's see what we're going to talk about today. Um, oh, I suppose. <laughs> uh, today, Tea and New Book Tuesday is the show where I preview fiction books that are coming to Mobile Public Library. They are already in the catalog. You can pre-order them and get them, in some cases, on the day that they're released. Depends on whether or not the distributor got it to us in time, but we often try for that. So... Today, we are going to talk about my tea. So, I made at the last minute, so this is hot and I might not drink it right away. I'm going to try a little right now and see how bad it is. It's warm. It's quite warm. But it also has lots of sugar, which is always good. I made Tazo Elderberry Blackberry. I had the glazed lemon loaf earlier, which honestly I do like a little better than this. Um... But this is a little tart and a little sweet, and it's a nice contrast. Um, I made it at the last minute because I didn't know if I had time to make a second cup of tea. Oh, but it is very soothing on my throat when I'm talking. So it's nice to have. Next up is... Oh, yes. Okay. So we have very exciting events coming because we're finally able to do events. After so very long of not being able to do them. So on Tuesday, April 5th at West Regional, we're going to have author Roy Hoffman. Uh, we're going to have an evening with Roy Hoffman. He will talk about his new book, which is The Promise of the Pelican. He'll also do a QA. and a um, So if you're interested in that, that's going to be, I think, one week from today, Tuesday, April 5th at 6.30 p.m. at West Regional. So that's very exciting. It's nice to start having events again. I'm planning stuff. For the summer, I think I'm going to do another escape room. I don't know where to put this. I'm going to put it over there. Um, probably ocean themed because the theme is ocean of possibilities this year. I finished Pride and Prejudice. Did I tell you that last week? Did I finish it last week? Does anybody know? Oh, Valerie's favorite tea is Blackberry Sage. That does sound good. Um... If I didn't tell you, I finished Pride and Prejudice. It's as much a masterpiece as it ever was. The layered psychology of all of these people is so well done. It's just mind-blowing. And I rewatched the um, the various adaptations. And I know everyone's in love with the Kira Knightley one, but I'm just not. It's very pretty. And it's nice to have seen an adaptation that had, like, a full budget and the whole nine yards. But, man, they had to cut a lot to get that in two hours. Like, every scene is super fast. Uh, Penn's glad about events, too. We are all glad about being able to come into the library for events, aren't we? Um, so, yeah. But, I mean, the 1995 BBC... Is still the best one. It looks like 90s British television. <laughs> it just does. Um, but they've preserved the story really well. Although I really want someone to do another adaptation and I want I want someone to look someone like Greta Gerwig to really look at these characters the way she did with Little Women. Because I think there's a lot, I think it's easy to dismiss Mrs. Bennet as a flighty and insignificant person, but the threat she was worried about, that she and her, her husband would die and that she and her daughters would be turned out in the streets, is a very real one that she had to live with. And getting her daughters married was the only recourse she had. So, and also... All of her behavior is someone who has, like, anxiety and depression. 
So I think a modern look at this that's still set in the Regency era would be worth doing. Although, I don't know, the last one was 2005, so we're coming up on 20 years. So maybe somebody will do it. If they, they can look at it differently. At any rate, um, yeah, Valerie's pointing out she loves the cinematography in the 2005 Kira Knightley one. Uh, and she enjoys her as Elizabeth, which, yes, I do like Kira Knightley as Elizabeth. I agree with that. I do like uh, Jennifer Earl a little better because she leaned in on Elizabeth's humor. But I think Kira Knightley presented the whole person a little better. Whereas I think Jennifer Eel was leaning so hard on the humor as a way to explain her that that's not a bad thing. It's just the angle she came out and she came at it pretty hard. Um, but who doesn't love the BBC version? Nobody who's seen it, basically. Okay, moving onward. In today's stream, we are going to talk about science fiction, fantasy, horror, and some critically acclaimed titles. And I think I have a little bit of all of those. There's definitely at least one of each. So that should get around to everybody. And if we go on... Oh, yes! Time to do your favorite part of Tia New Book Tuesday and mine, the giveaway. All right. Starting out... Okay. So the giveaway works the same way it always does. Oh, wait. Oh, say Valerie De Palma has said, I read a book about the victims of Jack the Ripper that go into what the women dealt with and how laws worked against women. And it truly shows that Mrs. Bennett's fears were valid. Absolutely. Because there's a whole discussion in terms of the era of Jack the Ripper, which is very similar in time or it's it's not very far apart in time period um the number of women that had been pushed into into sex work is staggering like the 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 limitations on women at that time period will blow you away like how few modes of expression how few means of earning a living just how few options both legally and culturally they had will just tell you so much about the choices that they made. There's a whole thing with Mrs. Bennett too, where she, the one thing she, she did marry up a little bit. That's one of the reasons like Lady Catherine de Bourgh is so dismissive of Elizabeth. Her, her father's a gentleman, but her mother is not or not from that kind of family. So, the one thing she brings to this marriage is her ability to do that. And now she wants to do that for her daughters. And as I, I was talking over this with my mother, too, and she's like, from a certain reading, Mr. Bennett is not doing much and is not getting involved and is not caring what's happening here, which is a very problematic male attitude of, well, you're overdoing your fears. You shouldn't be so worried about this. Because it doesn't affect him. Like, if his wife and children and daughters are turned out on the street, it'll, be ha it'll happen when he's gone. And he doesn't, he just isn't taking an active role in this. Which, as an adult, I'm re-looking at this and thinking, what are they doing for these girls? Like, they're not taking them to London. They're not taking them to Bath. What effort are they putting into getting them married? Because even Austin's parents took her to her and Cassandra to Bath at one point. And it was partly for her father's health. But I think it might have partly been to see if they could get Jane and Cassandra married off. And I think that was, that was a valid way of doing that in that time. Introduce them to a new society, to a group of new people, and... Maybe they'll hit it off with someone and then they'll they'll have a home of their own that they get to run and they'll get to have children and they'll get to live what in their era is a full life. So, yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot to look at there. Okay, back to the giveaway. So, I've already got the giveaway up and active. It is a Google form. The, the link is in the comments here. If you want to get on there, give me your contact information. Choose one of today's books. <laughs> I've got a lot of people choosing two. 
if you choose to, I'm just going to pick one of those two at random. And that's the one you're entered for. Um, so yes, you, you choose one, you will be entered for that. I'll do the drawing in about 24 hours and I'll start sending, notifying people and sending them out to, oh no. I looked frozen for a minute. Was I frozen? Let me watch the thing and see if I was frozen. Am I still frozen? Okay, I'm back. Um, yeah, I'll start notifying people around lunchtime tomorrow and sending them out because our transit picks up at like 1.30, 2.30. So I want to get them in there so they can get to the branch that you need to pick it up at. Like, toot sweet. Okay, so today's giveaway books are Beginning with A Little Hope by Ethan Joella. I have sort of three literary and one fantasy because uh, that's what I got on the shelf. This is a deeply moving, life-affirming novel about the residents of a small Connecticut town facing their fears and desires, a lost love, a stalled career, a diagnosis that highlight the beauty in the everyday. So that's a little help. Next up we have No Land to Light On by Yara Zagib. 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 Okay. East meets West, an American marriage in this... Exit West meets an American marriage in this breath breathtaking novel. About a love as immense and free as the sky above walls and borders between two young Syrians living in America who are separated by a travel ban. Um, so that's No Light to Land On. Next up we have We Are Not Like Them by Catherine Pride and Joe Piazza. This is a lifelong friendship between two women, one black and one white, is tested when a police shooting connects them in ways they could have never expected. A powerful and poignant exploration of race in America today. So that's We Are Not Like Them. Next up, God of Mercy by Okizi Nwaka. This is the fantasy novel today. And it doesn't have a short description, so we're going to do the long description. In the Igbu village of Ishlu, the, people worship, the people's worship of their gods is absolute, and their adherence to tradition has allowed them to evade the influence of colonization. But the village is reckoning with changes, including a war between gods signaled by Giloma, a girl who can fly. As tensions between Ishu and the neighboring colonized village, Iloma is forced to exile. Reckoning with her powers and exposed to the outside world, Iloma is imprisoned by a Christian church under the accusation of being a witch. Suffering through isolation, she comes to understand the truth of merciful love. With a sprawling cast of characters and lyrical prose, God of Mercy reframes the nature of tradition and cultural heritage, establishing a folklore of the uncolonized. It is a novel born of the diaspora about wrestling with gods, confronting demons, and discovering one's true purpose. So that's God of Mercy. All right, if you want to win any of these, get on that Google form, give me your contact information, pick one of the books out, and you could win as early and have it in your hand as early as tomorrow. All right, let's move right along to our program. Let's get these slides up here and talk about some books. All right, beginning with some science fiction. Atomic Anna by, okay, I think I have this one right. Maybe. Rachel Berenbaum. Sound good? Okay. In 1986, renowned nuclear scientist Anna Berkova is sleeping in her bed in the Soviet Union when Chernobyl's reactor melts down. It's the exact moment she tears through time. And it's an accident. When she opens her eyes, she's landed in 1992 only to discover Molly, her estranged daughter, shot in the chest. Molly, with her dying breath, begs Anna to go back in time and stop the disaster, to save Molly's daughter Risa and put their family's future on a better path. In 60s Philadelphia, Molly is coming of age as an adopted refusenik. Her family is full of secrets and a past they won't share. She finds solace in comic books, drawing her own series, Atomic Anna, and she's determined to make it as an artist. When she meets the volatile, volatile charismatic Victor, their romance sets her life on a very different course. In the 80s, Riza is a lonely teen and math prodigy until a quiet, 
handsome boy moves in across the street and an odd old woman shows up claiming to be her biological grandmother. As Risa finds new issues of Atomic Anna in unexpected places, she notices each comic challenges her to solve equations, leading to one impossible conclusion, time travel, as she finally understands what she has to do. As these remarkable women work together to prevent the greatest nuclear disaster of the 20th century, they grapple with the power their discoveries hold. Just because you can change the past, does it mean you should? This got starred review from both Publishers Weekly and Kirkus. If you're interested in Atomic Anna, it comes out April 5th. Wait, where's my thing? There's my thing. Okay. All right. Woman Eating by Claire Coda. I love the cover of this one. There's a few cool covers this, um, this week. Okay. Lydia is hungry. She's always wanted to try Japanese food. Sashimi, ramen, unigiri with sour plum stuffed inside, the food her Japanese father liked to eat. And then there's bubble tea and iced coffee, ice cream and cake, and forged herbs and plants, and the vegetables grown by the other young artists at the London studio space she is secretly squatting in. But Lydia can't eat any of these things. Her body doesn't work like those of other people. The only thing she can digest is blood, and it turns out that she's sourcing freck that sourcing fresh pig's blood in London, where she is living away from her vampire mother for the first time, is much more difficult than she anticipated. Then there are the humans, the other, the other artists at the studio pay, space, the people at the gallery she interns at, the strange men that follow her after dark, and Ben, a boyish, goofy grinned artist she is developing feelings for. Lydia knows that they are her natural prey, but she can't bring herself to feed on them. In her windowless studio, where she paints and studies the work of other artists, binge-watches Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and videos of people eating food on YouTube and Instagram, Lydia considers her place in the world. She has many of the things humans wish for. Perpetual youth, near invulnerability, immortality, but she is miserable. She is lonely, and she is hungry. Always hungry. As Lydia develops as a human and an artist, she will learn that she must reconcile the conflicts with her, between her demon and her human side, her mixed ethnic heritage, and her relationship with food, and in turn, humans, if she is to find a way to exist in the world. Before any of this, however, she must eat. This uh, is a first novel, and it's already gotten a star review from Library Journal, it's considered horror, unsurprisingly. If you're interested in woman eating, it comes out April 12th. All right. Moving on to... Maybe? The Devil's Dictionary by Stephen Kotler. The Devil's Dictionary finds lion zorn enmeshed with a strange subculture polyamorous cryptocurrency fiends with a tendency towards eco-terrorism. That's a lot. <laughs> the crypto ego punks have executed the largest land grab in U.S. history, buying up huge swaths of the American West to establish the world's first mega linkage. This unbroken tract of wild land stretching from Yellowstone to Yucatan is meant to protect biodiversity and stave off the sixth great extinction. But something's rotten in Eden. Instead of saving existing species, exotic creatures unlike anything seen on Earth keep turning up. Called in to track down the origin of these exotics, Lion quickly finds himself entangled in a battle for the survival of our species. This got a star review from Kirkus Magazine, so if you're interested... You're interested in the Devil's Dictionary, it comes out April 19th. You can't, the, I couldn't see the little wolf on the cover until, I mean, he's not little, but I couldn't see him because of the shading until I put him on this slide. Oh, this is from a very popular author, T. T Kingfisher, Nettle and Bone by T. King, T. Ugh, I'm trying to talk too fast. This is what happens. Nettle and Bone by T. Kingfisher. After years of seeing her sisters suffer at the hands of an abusive prince, Mara, the shy, convent-raised, third-born daughter, has finally realized that no one is coming to their rescue. No one, 
except for Mara herself. Seeking help from a powerful grave witch, Mara is offered the tools to kill a prince, if she can complete three impossible tasks. But as is the way in the tale of princes, witches, and daughters, the impossible is only the beginning. On her quest, Mara is joined by the grave witch, a reluctant fairy godmother, a strapping former knight, and a chicken possessed by a demon. Together, the five of them intend to be the hand that closes around the throat of the prince and frees Mara's family and their kingdom from its tyrannous ruler at last. This got starred reviews from both Library Journal and Publishers Weekly. So if you're interested in Nettle and Bone, it comes out April 26th. All right. This is our last Supernaturally book of today by a very popular author, Alma Katsu. I read Katsu's The Hunger, and I think I talked about it with Carly on our podcast. It was very good. It's about uh, the Donner Party. This is The Fervor by Alma Katsu. 1944. As World War II rages on, the threat has come to the home front. In a remote corner of Idaho, Miko Briggs and her daughter Aiko are desperate to return home. Following Miko's husband's enlistment as an Air Force pilot in the, Pacific's months, in the Pacific months prior, Miko and Aiko were taken from their home in Seattle and sent to one of the internment camps in the Midwest. It doesn't matter that Aiko was American-born. They were Japanese and therefore considered a threat by the American government. Mother and daughter attempt to hold on to elements of their old life in the camp when a mysterious disease begins to spread among those interned. What starts as a minor cold quickly becomes spontaneous fits of violence and aggression, even death. And when a disconcerting team of doctors arrive, nearly more threatening than the illness itself, Miko and her daughter team up with a newspaper reporter and a widowed missionary to investigate, and it becomes clear to them that something more sinister is afoot a demon from the stories of Miko's childhood, hell-bent on infiltrating their already strange world. Inspired by the Japanese yokai and the... Okay. Yorogumo spider demon. Yor Yorogumo spider demon. The fervor explores a supernatural threat beyond what anyone saw coming. The danger of demonization, a mysterious contagion, and the, stir the search to stop its spread before it's too late. This got starred re reviews from Booklist and Library Journal, Alma Katz, whose books usually do. So if you're interested in The Fervor by Alma Katsu, it comes out April 26th. All right. Now we're going to move on to the sort of critically acclaimed books. A lot of these don't have a clear genre because that's how I sort of gave them this title. Uh, but I think you should hear about them anyway, and I don't have another place to put them, so they're going to go here. Starting with Let's Not Do That Again by Grant Ginder, maybe? Ginder? Gander? Someone named Grant. Anyway, Nancy Harriman is running for Senate, and she's going to win, goddammit. Not that that's her slogan, although it should be. This is what she's worked so hard for the years after her husband's untimely death, which was definitely not her fault, and inheriting his seat in the House of Representatives. She said all the right things, passed all the right legislation, chapped her lips kissing babies. There's just one problem. Her grown children. Greta and Nick Harriman are adrift. Nick, recently heartbroken, is floundering in his attempts to write a musical about the life of Joan Didion, called Hello to All That. And then there's his sister Greta. Smart, pretty, and completely unmotivated by anything, allowing her life to pass her by like the shoppers at the Apple store where she works. But then one morning, the world wakes up, not to Nancy making headlines, but Greta. She's in Paris with extremist protesters, throwing a bottle of champagne through a beloved bistro's front window. In order to save her campaign, not to mention her daughter, Nancy and Nick must find Greta before it's too late. Smart and poignant, funny and tear-jerking, let's not do that again, proves that like democracy, family is a messy and fragile thing that means more than any mother or senator could ever dream. This got starred reviews from both Kirkus and Publishers Weekly. So if you're interested in Let's Not Do That Again, it comes out April 5th. 
I love an expressive title. <laughs> it's not do that again. Though my favorite is still Your Mother's a Witch. Anyway, moving on. Yes, moving on. So True Biz is an, um, an exclamation in American Sign Language. It means really, seriously, definitely, or real talk. I believe the figure that the hand is making on the cover is that sign. Uh, for context. The students at the River Valley School for the Deaf just want to hook up pass their history final, and have doctors, politicians, and their parents stop telling them what to do with their bodies. This revelatory novel plunges readers into the halls of a residential school for the deaf, where they'll meet Charlie, a rebellious transfer student who's never met another deaf person before, Austin, the school's golden boy, whose world is rocked when his baby sister is born hearing, and February, the headmistress, who is fighting to keep her school open and her marriage intact, but might not be able to do both. As a series of crises, both personal and professional, threaten to unravel each of them, Charlie, Austin, and February find their lives inextricable, inextricable from one another and change forever. This is a story of sign language and lip reading, cochlear implants and civil rights, isolation and injustice, first love and loss, and above all, great persistence, daring, and joy. Absorbed and assured, idiosyncratic and relatable, this is an unforgettable journey into the deaf community and a universal celebration of human connection. This got starred reviews from both Booklist and Publishers Weekly. If you're interested in True Biz, spelled with a Z, it comes out April 5th. Nobody Gets Out Alive Stories by Lee Newman. Set in Newman's home state of Alaska, nobody gets... Why are you talking to me, computer? I'm trying to do things. Leave me alone. Okay. Nobody Gets Out Alive is a collection of dazzling, courageous stories about women struggling to survive not just grizzly bears and charging moose, but the raw, exhausting legacy of their marriages and families. In Howell Palace, which won the Paris Review's Terry Southern Prize, it was a Best American Short Story and a Pushcart Prize Collection. Pushcart Prize Selection. An aging widow struggles with a rogue hunting dog and the memories of her five ex-husbands while selling her house after bankruptcy. I kind of want to know the story of five ex-husbands, but moving on to the next story. In the title story, Nobody Gets Out Alive. Newly married Katrina visits her hometown of Anchorage and blows up her own wedding reception by flirting with the host and running off with an enormous mastodon tusk. I, I have a friend who's a wedding planner, and I might call her and be like, have you ever seen a bride in full dress flirting with someone who is not her groom? <laughs> because it would not surprise me if it has happened. Anyway, along sto alongside stories set in today's last frontier, rife with suburban sprawl, global warming, and opioid addiction, Newman delves into remote wilderness of the 70s and 80s, bringing to life young girls and single moms in search of a wilder, freer, and more adventurous America. The final story takes place in a railroad camp in 1915, where an outspoken heiress stages an elaborate theatrical in order to seduce the wife of her husband's employer, revealing how this masterful storyteller is not only writing unforgettable, brilliantly complex characters, she's somehow inventing souls. This got star reviews from both Kirkus and Publishers Weekly. If you're interested in this collection of short stories called Nobody Gets Out Alive, it comes out April 12th. All right. Young Mungo by Douglas Stewart. Growing up in a housing estate in Glasgow, Mungo and James are born under different stars. Mungo a Protestant and James a Catholic, and they should be sworn enemies if they're to be seen as men at all. Yet against all odds, they become best friends as they find a sanctuary in the pigeon dovecote that James has built for his prize racing birds. As they fall in love, they dream of finding somewhere they belong, while Mungo works hide, hard to hide his true self from all those around him, especially his big brother Hamish, a local gang leader with a brutal reputation to uphold. And when several months later, Mungo's mother sends him on a fishing trip to a lock in western Scotland with two strange men, whose drunken banter bellies murky paths, he will need to summon all his inner strength and courage to try to get back to a place of safety, a place where he and James might still have a future. 
imbuing the everyday world of its characters with rich lyricism and giving full voice to people rarely acknowledged in the literary world. Young Mungo is a gripping and revealing story about the bonds of masculinity, the divisions of sectarianism, the violence faced by many queer people, and the dangers of loving someone too much. This got starred reviews from Library Journal, Publishers Weekly, Kirkus, and Booklist. It is probably on shortlist for the best of the year. If you are interested in Young Mungo, it comes out April 15th. All right. Those are our books for today. Next week, we will talk about May hits. Uh, and I've already previewed what they're going to be. And it's so much summer beach, beach house, love on the beach, stuff on the beach, going to the beach. It's crazy. Um, but yes, join, uh, go ahead and sign up for the giveaway and uh, all that good stuff. Join me next week and uh, I don't know. Have a good week, guys. Bye.